So I said, what do you mean we don't own the phone number? He said, we, we always just use the phone number as a holding number on, our, on, all our, on all our layouts, on our layouts, on our, our first proofs. It, it's been back and forth to clients, it's been approved. No one even considered up until this very moment that that phone number wasn't ours. We hadn't actually bought it. Thank you for inviting me to this. I think it's a terrific idea. Um, in fact, I had a really hard time deciding which fuck up to choose because after 30 years in business and uh, 30 years in advertising and 22, 22 years in King James, I've accumulated a very impressive list of fuck ups. So, um, the thing about fuck ups is that it's not just about the scale of it, it's also about the timing of it. So, um, I'm coming with one very simple story, but it's a rather it's a rather funny story. And I think what makes why I picked this particular story is that it is that it happened in the early days of King James. It was around about 2006. Um, and it was about 2006 and uh, we were very young. We were only seven years old or six, seven years old. And we were still kind of finding our way. And it's, it's important to remember that we didn't, <clears throat> we didn't start an agency to conquer anything. <laughs> we just started an agency to be ourselves and to be our masters of our own destiny. And, 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 and we suddenly started to look up and thought, actually, actually we, we don't, we're not shit at this. Actually, we're not, we're not doing too bad. We, and we might be better than we thought against even our own surprise. We were surprising ourselves. But in, in 2006, we were still, um, we had about 55 staff. So we were still really small and intimate. We were still trying to find our feet, but we were starting to get traction in business. We were starting to make inroads. It was probably the first time that the market was, was actually paying attention to, to us on the southern tip of, of, of South Africa. And um, we were winning, we had some cool brands. We were winning Kalula, we won Levi's, we were, we were doing some cool stuff on Bells. Um, we had just done, we just launched the first um, online bank in South Africa called 2020. Uh, and it was a fantastic success. And we were, we were also making our first ads for, for Alan Gray. So it was the first flicker of hope that we had that actually this, this was, was really something that could be quite special for us. And I suppose, and we'd also just, oddly enough, in 2006, we had just won back-to-back -back Grand Prix at Lurie's. So we were going, hold on. Um, and people were noticing us. So uh, we were starting to look like a fairly, uh, ooh, you show off you. <laughs> I don't have anything here to show you. Nothing except a glass of wine. <laughs> um, but um, I think the thing about fuck ups is that they generally happen just when you start to believe in yourself. And that's why they become a, a quite a poignant reminder of your, your, you can't start drinking your own Kool-Aid. And that's the awesome thing about this particular fuck up. So the scenario is this. It was... Um, it was a very early morning. I was at like nine o'clock in the morning. I was having my first cup of coffee. I was in the office, ready to start my day. Um, just go back. Sorry, can go back one more. Do any? Can I go back one? Sorry. Yes, you um, want to take over control, Alistair. If you give a click, you're going to have the control and, and do it if you want. I'll do it straight after this slide. Anyone who's ever worked at King James knows that I end my emails to all staff with one of these three things and sometimes a combination of these. I either go, roger that, over and out, it's a fuck up. Um, and sometimes I, I do two, like roger that, over and out, L. Or roger that, it's a fuck up, L. And I choose, and, and I put a trademark there because it became such a signature to my emails that people, I, I just said, that's it, I'm gonna own, it's a fuck up. Because actually, um, it was so, so, common in my in my mails because I was angry and frustrated and I and everything was a fuck up to me in the early days. Um it still is, mind you. I haven't gotten over that. But um but in 2006, uh and I choose I choose I don't say it's a fuck up too often anymore. But in, it's so it's 9 a.m. in 2006 into my office walks my head of client service, a lovely lady named Melanie and she goes we have a problem. So now anyone who knows me knows that I like to live in my head. I don't really like to deal with problems in the real world. I like to deal with problems 
that I've been given creative problems, challenges for my clients. Like I'm not so good with problems in the real world. I deal with them, but I do so reluctantly. And unfortunately, James was away. He was overseas at the time. So I was the go-to guy on this particular situation. And she walked and said, we've got a problem. And I said, what is it? She said, it's Vintook. Now, we just won this account called Vintook Lager. And it was a terrific win for us. Um, we were now doing beer. We were doing whiskey. We were doing mini and joe. We had a car account, a whiskey account. I mean, what else do you want? A bank, uh, an investment company. You don't want anything else and a fashion brand. You don't want anything else as, a, as, an, as an owner of an ad, ad agency. And, and I said, okay, what's the problem? Now, the thing you must remember in 2006 is that we had a, we had a, we, everything was a problem back then when you ran promotions because the logistics were always a big problem. You didn't, you didn't have, it was pre-digital. You didn't have social media. You didn't, you couldn't do digital entering. You couldn't do those things we take for granted today didn't exist. In those days, if you did a competition, you had to print the phone number on everything. You had to print it on cans, on beer bottle labels, on tent cards, on bunting, on beer coasters and on shelf wobblers and on Everything was printed way in advance, and then on this particular day, it was all being pumped out of the car, out of the factories. The beer was being shipped out of Vintook. Um, this was a national promotion. All you had to do was dial this phone number, and you could win a holiday to Namibia. It doesn't sound so impressive now, <laughs> but I'm sure in 2006 it was a very impressive uh, prize. Um, and the phone number, and I always remember this, the phone number was the world's greatest phone number. And it was this. It was, it was 082 345 6789. This was the phone number we had put on cans, on bottles, on bunting, on beer coasters, on you hundreds of competition paraphernalia was being shipped as we spoke. So I said, okay, what's the problem? She goes, we don't own the phone number. So I said, what do you mean we don't own the phone number? She said, we, we always just use the phone number as a holding number on, our, on, all, our, on all our layouts, on our layouts, on our, our first proofs. It, it's been back and forth to clients, it's been approved. No one even considered up until this very moment that that phone number wasn't ours. We hadn't actually bought it. So I said, well, who owns the phone number? She says, I don't know. So I said, well, okay, we, we've got to sort this out. So she said, well, should we, should we phone the clients? I said, God, no, um, <laughs> not yet. We have to unfuck this, actually. It's our problem. It's our mistake. We need to fix it and we need to, and then we'll tell the client but I'm not gonna phone the client and tell them that we're going to fix a problem that we've created. So I said, first things first, we have to sort this out, it's at our cost. Now I know in 2006, we were, um, as I said, we were 55 people, so it wasn't a big agency. Um, money was money, it was straight off your bottom line. I mean, you didn't make a lot of, a lot of, a lot of cash um, at that size of an agency. Um, but, um, so I said, it's our cost, so I said, First things first, phone the number. She said, okay, I'm on it. Off she went. An hour later, she comes back, and now she's looking pale, like, 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 her, like her stress levels have been elevated. So I said, okay, what's the story? She said, okay, I phoned the number. And a gentleman answered. I said, fabulous. He said, and I launched into, try not to look too desperate. I launched into an explanation that we would really like to use this number in a, and I called on all my, my feminine guy, uh, wiles. I was a little bit flirtatious, a little bit chatty. And a good 15 seconds into my explanation, he went, no speak English, Chinese. <laughs> uh, so she carried on talking a bit and he just said, no, no speak English, Chinese. So the first question was, is what is it, it man who doesn't speak English doing with a South African phone number? And I suppose that's, fairly uh, man you could have been on holiday it was a prepaid number evidently um but how were we going to explain to this person this man that we wanted this phone number for a for for a limited time without making him see dollar signs so so the first thing i said is well we've got to get a translator so off she went found the i think she found the chinese embassy and found all around town and she eventually 
found a translator. And the thing about translators is you don't know what they're translating. So we briefed him very carefully and said, we don't have a lot of money. We're a very small, humble agency, very small bank balance. You need to get this number and you need to get it as cost effectively as possible. And he went, sure. About 12 o'clock, we started to hear murmurs that, the, that we were talking about 20,000 Rand here. And we thought, okay, that's a fair amount of money. Our 20 grand sounds like a feasible amount of money for this, for this phone number, although it is a rock star phone number. By three o'clock, it was 14,000 Rand. By five o'clock, it was uh, 80,000 Rand. And by 6.30, it was 125,000 Rand. So by this stage, I'd started drinking heavily. Um, I was all on my own. My, my wingman, James, wasn't around to deal with these things. Um, and I was stressed. So at 6.30, she said she came in all excited as if 125,000 Rand was, was, was good news. She said, we've got it. All we have to do is give him a contract, but he wants it in Chinese. So he said, well, how do you do that? She says, well, well, we've got to get the lawyers to draw up the contract very simply because what we're going to do is we're going to buy this number for three months. Only three months only. Um, so off she went, she got a lawyer to type up the thing. And then we discovered that you can't just translate. You've got to, tr you've got to find a thing called, a you've got to find a typewriter, a Chinese typewriter that types in Chinese. And apparently they're rare as can be. They're very complex, I've only discovered recently. They, they, you, you use two hands and you do one half of the letter with one hand and one half with the other hand. And then you press the white digits and then it goes... <laughs> And it prints like eight words. So between the hours of eight o'clock and midnight, we were translating a legal document on this baby, something like this. Um, and because this was 2006, there, were, there was no email. So we had to fax this to Johannesburg because that's where the Chinese man was. And as it turns out, he was running a import export business out of Johannesburg. <laughs> and we don't know what that means. In, uh, at all, but in the early hours of the next morning, my managing director took a, hundred, a check for 125,000 rand and drove to, a, uh, uh, to Chinatown, which is there by Bruma Lake, and went down and back in the alley and he met this guy. And it was one of those situations where you've got a, hundred, a check for 125,000 rand and he's got the SIM card and you're going like this, you're going like this, and you're going like this. And you do it like this. And that is 125 grand. So he jumped on a plane and flew that baby back to us. Um, and I thought, and, 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 and it, I'll tell you the lessons now, because at that point in our agency's life, 125,000 rand was a spectacular amount of money. And it was crippling, actually. It was, a, it was, it was just, there were years when we didn't make 125,000 rand. So there was a lot of, it was a, it, we were battling, but we had rescued the situation. And when I was thinking about the story now, I was thinking that is still the greatest phone number on planet earth. And I've decided to phone it tonight and to see. Hey. <laughs> um, and I swear I haven't phoned this number yet. Um, I've been tempted all week. Okay, let's do it. It's answered by a, a Chinese man. I'm going to go, this is the most um, resilient businessman in South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are yeah, calling this number live right now. All right, all right two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, that's, there it is there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can see, I can see this. I don't think our attendees can see you. Um, but I can see that that's the number zero eight two three four five six seven eight nine. Let's see what happens. Okay, and well, and share me, and share me then. I'm just and un so and share the screen is what I'm saying. Okay. Then. There yes, we go. I can see you now. Okay, so we're gonna call this number. And I'm gonna put it on thing. And let's see if anyone answers. Let's do it. This mailbox is full and cannot accept any more messages at this time. This <laughs> <laughs> this mailbox is full. I cannot, I cannot accept any messages at this time. Okay. Oh, man. I'm actually really disappointed. I was hoping that someone would answer this phone and I was going to have a lack of chat. 
In fact, I was going to try and buy this number again for my own personal. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, it was uh, going to cost you 1.2 million now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'd be tempted for that's That's a damn good phone number. Hey? So anyway, so I'm, I'm going to keep it simple now because I just very quickly with the lessons, you know, I, I think the first lesson is never put on a layout <laughs> what you don't expect. Um, what you don't expect to be used uh, in 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 your in your end layout, and and since then King James has never we use X X X X X because it's obvious for obvious reasons. It's just a stupid mistake, but a but a sincere, honest one that anyone could make. And I think the the perhaps more importantly, I think what it what it teaches me is that every single uh, piece of work is everyone's responsibility. I mean, this piece of work bounced between. God knows how many client service people, credit people, copywriters, DTP people, art directors that went to the client, it got seen, it got, it got proof checked, it got sent. I don't know how many people looked at that and never questioned that number. And, and in an agency, it's so easy for someone to say, well, that's not my job. Get the copywriter to, to check, get this person to check, that's their job. But, but when, when, the, when the mistake is shared by everyone, Everyone has to share responsibility for such things. So there's, so you've got to, you, it, every piece of work is owned by every single person in the agency that, sets, that sees it. Perhaps, and this is more of a personal philosophy that I think plays out in this, in this story, sweat the small stuff. I'm a, I'm, there's an entire book written about don't sweat the small stuff, but it's absolute nonsense. If you don't sweat the small stuff, you probably won't sweat the big stuff. Um, and you can't get to the big stuff if you don't care about the small stuff. Um, and in this instance, I think a phone number is a very small thing that no one questioned and no one checked. Um, and and I think it, it's a, a spectacular, you know, we were flying high. Our confidence was firing on all cylinders. Um, you might build your reputation with big spectacular work, but but your reputations are easily toppled with the smallest mistakes. Um, and all the good that you've built by doing incredible things is undone by doing dumb things like this. Um, and, if, and that's not even mentioning the, 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 the cost to the thing. So it's just a general reminder, I think, on a more personal level that, you, that we're, we're all fallible, we all make mistakes, and that um, you must always look for. I don't, I don't want to romanticize mistakes because I think they suck and they, they, they do more good, they do more uh, damage than good. I, I don't really learn from them. I, I, they set me back um, in, in emotional ways too. So I think that it's all, it's all about just caring about everything and making sure, um, making sure you just see it through, yeah. Thank you for listening to my story. I'm gonna have a glass of wine. <coughs> Have you ever failed in a project, career, or business? Whether you have or not, you can become a Fuck Up Nights organizer in your city, company, or university. Learn how at fuckupnights.com. Join the movement. Fuck up the system.